Good morning, everybody. It is Sunday, April the 11th at 8 o'clock in the morning. Of course, this is not a live broadcast. We record these on Saturdays and broadcast them on Sunday because Sundays are very busy days for me, and I try to reserve my mornings for the Lord. We're starting a revival meeting this morning with Brother Oliver Areza. We're excited about all that God's going to do. In fact, we're also kicking off our spring program at this time, and so we want to see what God does over the next eight weeks. I hope that you'll be in prayer for us. If you're not local, if you are local, man, be in prayer for us and jump in and let's get involved in this thing and let's see what God does through, pardon me, through us. All right. So we're in Romans right now, the book of Romans, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. And we're in chapter number six this morning. And uh, we've been talking about how sinful man is and how the law reveals to man how sinful he is. Then we talked about how salvation comes not through works, not through living a good life or being righteous or keeping the law. Salvation comes by grace through faith. It comes through belief. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness, we also believe God and it's counted unto us for righteousness. Then yesterday we learned the contrast between Adam being one man who brought sin in and Christ being one man who brought life in. And so now we're going to talk about the new life that we have in Christ. And it finished yesterday talking about where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. And then we finished verse number 21 of chapter 5, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness. And so there's this comparison between sin and grace and how where sin is found, grace is there and grace always trumps sin. And so it's going to pick up there with verse number one of chapter six. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So let's pray and we're going to pick it right up. Father, we ask your blessing here on our reading and our study this morning. And I pray your blessing and help on it. Give us wisdom, please. Give us the mind of Christ. In his name we ask. Amen. All right, so that's the first verse. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So since the presence of sin brings this abundance of grace, why don't we keep sinning so that we get more and more grace? And so Paul is posing that question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2, God forbid. So here's the argument that people give to us when they hear that we believe that once you put your faith in Christ for salvation, that you're always saved. Once saved, always saved. Once we give our hearts to the Lord and we put our faith in Christ, he seals us into the day of redemption. And people say, well, if I believe that, then I just sin all I wanted to. But that's not the response. That's not the result. That's like saying, you know, if you're down on your luck and you're having a tough time and uh, someone reaches out and helps you and benefits you and gets you back on your feet again and helps you get your life in order, then when that person wants something from you or desires something from you, you say, no, I don't owe you anything. In fact, I'm going to go back and do what I used to do. No, you wouldn't do that. You'd say, thank you for your help. Thank you for, for saving me. Thank you for fixing my life and turning it around. And if you ever need anything, you tell me. I'm glad to do it. And that's what the Bible says. We love him because he first loved us. So the natural response to forgiveness of sin isn't to go back into it because we know we can get away with it. That's not the heart's desire of a truly born again Christian. So shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And we're going to see throughout this chapter, and this is a wonderful chapter. Those of you who are struggling with sin, those of you who have some besetting sins that keep getting the best of you, those of you who are, are messing up, you're, you're, you're living in sin still, you're not getting right with God over these things, you are the one that this chapter is talking to. And it's talking to all of us, of course. But those of you who are struggling with sin, this is your get out of jail free card or you know break free from your sin card here. So if we're dead to sin, how can we, if we're dead to sin, live any longer therein? Verse 3, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, 
that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. When we baptize people at our church, we have uh, some words that we say as we baptize. And so the person is standing up, uh, facing uh, one direction, and we have them plug their nose with one hand and grab their elbow with their other hand, and we're going to take them back into the water. We're going to bring them up out of the water. And when we do that, it pictures the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we even say these words, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, there are some churches that say buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. I don't think either one of those are wrong or improper. I think either one are, are good to use. And that's what this is talking about here. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Read verse 4 again. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even uh, we also should walk in newness of life. When you're getting baptized, you're telling the world, you know what? I'm not the same person I used to be. I'm somebody different now. Christ has saved me. He's redeemed me. My sins are forgiven and I belong to him. And so I'm being raised to walk in newness of life as a new person. Verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. And so we're dying to our old man and we're being raised as a new man. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man, who we used to be, is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Once a person is saved, their purpose is no longer to serve sin. Before they're saved, guess what their purpose is? To serve sin. They don't know any better. They have no other recourse. They have no other choice. It's just, okay, I'm going to live for myself. I'm going to live for the pleasure of sin. This is all that life is about. God says, no, it's not all that it's about. And we're going to put your old man to death so that you can be raised to walk in a manner that does not serve sin. If you're a Christian, you no longer need to serve sin. Your old man has been crucified. Now, I'm not talking about sinless perfection here, although we should be improving and growing and, and casting off sinful behaviors. We still have that flesh. We still have that sin nature. We're never going to get past that until we're in our glorified bodies, but we can be seeing sin drop off of us because we're dead to that old man. We do not need to serve sin any longer. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin, that old man being dead. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So just as we've died with him, we'll resurrect and live with him. Verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Once a person has overcome death by resurrection, they need, never again need to fear death. It doesn't hold dominion over them. That's true for Christ. That's true for any saint of God who passes. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So when we die to our old man, we're dying to sin, and now we're resurrecting to live as a new creature. Verse 11, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Reckon means to consider. Consider yourself dead to sin. So the next time you're tempted to do wrong and you say, boy, should I do that? Say, no, I'm dead to that. That holds no power over me any longer. I don't have to give in to that. I can say no to that. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we died to sin, we're alive to God. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. So now he's saying, you know what, get control of this sinful desire. Don't let it reign anymore. Don't let it have preeminence. It's still going to be there, but crush it. Get rid of it. Put, put it away from you. Verse 13. This is really important verse. This word yield. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, 
but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So you have two groups, if you will, two entities to which you can yield yourself. And by yield your members, it means, you know, your mouth, your brain, your hands, your feet. So let's say there's John and there's Tom, and both of them say, hey, you know, you got anything going on on Saturday? And you go, you know, I don't have anything going on. And John says, hey, I'd like you to come help me move. I got to pack the U-Haul up and, and I need to move to my new house. So I need help loading up the truck, getting it to the new place and unloading the truck. And then Tom says, hey, I need help putting my boat in the water. Will you help me go get it from the marina and put it on the trailer and take it to the dock and get it in the water? And uh, if you help me with that, we'll go out and go fishing while we're in the lake. And so you're going to yield yourself to one of these two guys. You're either going to yield your members to John to help him move. You're going to yield your members to Tom to help him put his boat in the water and go fishing. And so which would you rather do? I'll tell you what, I'd rather go fishing any day than go help somebody move. That's the worst idea I can ever think of. And so that's a bit of a silly illustration, but same thing. Here's Satan wanting you to yield your members to him. Give me your time and your energy and your body and use it for what I want you to use it for. And God's over here saying, no, give me your time and your energy and your body and give yourself to me that I can use it for my purposes. So read it again, verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. So you don't give your hands to the devil. You don't give your tongue to the de devil. You don't give your feet to the devil. You don't give your brain to the devil. You give it to God, but yield yourselves unto God. See, it's on, in our control. What are we going to submit to? Do we submit to temptation or do we submit to righteousness? Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. And so sin no longer rules our lives. We're under the grace of God now, not the condemnation of the law. Verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. We're going all the way back to the beginning again, aren't we? Because of uh, the grace of God, we're not going to continue in sin. Verse 16, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants are to whom ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So if I yield myself to John to help him move, I'm his servant. If I yield myself to Tom to help him put his boat in the water, I'm his servant. Whoever you yield to, that's your new master. So when temptation and sin comes, if you yield to that, that's your master. But if God says, I want you to yield to me and you do that, then that's your master. So you're going to decide you'll yield either to God or your yield to sin, sin unto death, or obedience unto righteousness. Verse number 17, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. So he said, you used to be a servant of sin, but thank God you obeyed the gospel and you put your faith in Christ. You're now delivered from that. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So now that we're free, now that we don't have to go help John move, we can go help Tom put his boat in the water. Verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield ye your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. And so he's saying, now you've got a choice. You don't have to serve sin anymore. Now serve righteousness. Verse 20, for when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Before we got saved, we couldn't even serve righteousness. All we could serve was sin. But now that we're free from sin and death, we're allowed or free to serve righteousness. Verse 21, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. He says, you know, what good came from all of your living in sin? 
Did any good come from it at all? I don't think so. Verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And so sin didn't pay off anything, but righteousness pays off holiness and everlasting life. Verse 23, and it sums up the chapter here, for the wages of sin is death. What you earn from sinning is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's it pays far greater dividends to serve God than it does to serve sin. All right, I'm done with that. Thanks for watching this morning. If you're local, please come to church today. 9 a.m. Sunday school, 10 a.m. morning service, 5 o'clock Sunday school, 5.45 evening service. Then Monday night at 7 is our revival meeting. Tuesday night at 7, revival meeting. Wednesday night at 7, revival meeting. So we're having uh, uh, Evangelist Oliver Areza here preaching for us. We're kicking off our spring program. Hatfields versus the McCoys. We'll see whose family is able to get more people into church. We're having a great time with all this. Come and see us. If you're not local, you can watch us online. We'd be glad to have you and honored to. But thanks for watching this morning. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. God bless you.